Okay, so hi, welcome. Um, bienvenido <laughs> to the media party. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say a special thank you to Mariano for inviting me down here. Um, it's my second time in Buenos Aires, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, and thank you all for waking up early and coming here, um, and especially for listening to me yammer on the stage. Uh, so I think Mariano might have said this, but I didn't, under I didn't quite catch everything he said. But I'll be talking about too much information or why having programmer journalist smarts are indispensable. <clears throat> well, I mean, and forgive me, but uh, demasiada de información <laughs> en español. It's okay. You can laugh at me. Um, I'm trying. Uh, so, yeah, hi. Um, my name is Jackie Marr, and I have been working at the New York Times for the last four years. Um, I'm an assistant editor on the interactive news desk. And uh, that's a picture of me just taken um, in the office. And yeah, I do dress like that every day. <laughs> um, that was actually um, right after coming back from the Olympics. And I don't know if you could tell, I was wearing a lot of you know, swag from the Olympics and memorabilia. Anyway, uh, so um, that was a very, very brief uh, shot of who I am, um, but who are all of us? We are hacks hackers, right? Um, and there's that slash between the, the two terms. Um, I think what that really means is that we're hybrids. At, you know, if we're, if we're really doing both sides of the divide, uh, the tech side and the reporting side, we should be hybrids. And hybrids are kind of like unicorns. They're pretty rare. Um, to find them. So I think everyone in this auditorium is part of a very special and new and innovative group of people. Um, I was kind of wondering uh, how many of you, if I can see, how many of you came from the more traditional reporting side? Okay. And how many from tech and moved into reporting? Seems like it's about even. Okay. So my story is I came from, I came from the tech side. And I got started in the hacker scene. Uh, I didn't rollerblade, but um, I started in the hacker scene when I was a teenager, uh, growing up in New York City. Um, I found it. I found it very interesting, and it was also kind of, you know, not something you're supposed to do. Which, when I was a teenager, and even today, kind of attractive. And um, I went on to, you know, buy a lot of books on C programming and a whole bunch of different languages, and learn about that. But I was always more interested in how you can use technology to solve problems or to have fun or make life better, M more so than you know figuring out how to like craft the perfect algorithm or or even to be honest, hack a system. I was not really overly interested in that. Um, which brings me to the other part of that slash, right? The hybrid, the hack. Um, and, you know, hack, being a journalist, uh, I got attracted to journalism because, and especially the sort of data journalism or interactive news kind of journalism, because it, it seemed to me like the perfect way to take technology and solve a problem, which is how to get information to people and how to make people more interested in what's going on around them and how to give them a better perspective. And that's that's what brought me into it. So the hacks, hackers. So what do we do? We work with information, right? And I'll get to why I said too much in a minute, but ideally, in our day jobs, what we do is we take information, or, sorry, information, <laughs> and we unlock it. Um, we make it so that people can have more context uh, there is so much data out there, and people, like even people who are in this line of work, don't know what, where all the data comes from, or where where to find it, or what data sets are even available. So part of our job is to unlock that and to present it in a compelling way to people. And here are some ways that we do that. We do that for elections. Uh, this is from the homepage of the New York Times the night of the presidential election. 
so we do it uh, to show how votes break down uh, across different parties, um, across different parts of government. And we try to do it in a way that's not just like this long list, you know, of like, you know, this is how like, you know, the state of New York voted or whatever. Like we try to do it in a way that makes it a little more interesting to people so that you can look and with colors and, and, and progress bars and slide bars and stuff, you can just tell at a glance where the election's going. We do it also in more creative ways. This is um, from a uh, directive that the Times did showing the various ways that a candidate who's running for the presidency could make it to the White House. Um, this is something that would be kind of hard to convey, I think, in a block of text. Um, and it's interactive. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it, but it lets you play around. So if Obama won Florida here, um, what would, what would Romney have to do to win the election and so on and so forth. We don't just do it with political data though. Uh, one, one area that really lends itself well, I found, to this kind of thing is sports. So here um, we're showing all of the world records that were broken in the last Olympics. Um, and the thing about world records is once a world record is set, it might not ever be broken. It could go on for a long time. So we were trying to figure out a way of showing when a record gets broken, was it set yesterday and broken today? Or how long did, was this like the best time someone had, had? And I think the longest one here is like 26 years, almost 27 years in that, in that women's track thing. So for 27 years, no one had ever bested that time. So we try to like come up with ways to give people more context. I can't, I'm not going to try to read this, um, but this, this is a piece that was featured in the Mozilla Source uh, magazine. Um, and it's showing, if I understand it correctly, it's showing how um, members of the Congress in Argentina uh, vote, if they vote along with their parties or not, and it does so in, in, again, a visual way. And another way that we highlight data sets, uh, this is from ProPublica. Uh, lets you look up your doctor and see how many prescriptions your doctor has written um, there. And so that's a data set that maybe the public doesn't have access to normally, or if they do, it's probably in some terrible format. I'm not sure what the original format was that ProPublica used, but it probably was something like a, you know, a comma-separated thing, or maybe they even just scraped it, or whatever. Um, the idea is, though, to give people access to the information that's most relevant to them. So, going back to what I said I was going to talk about before, uh, too much information. <clears throat> the ways that I was just showing, those are not what I would call too much information. I think those are great ways of taking data and making it more accessible. Um, the re part of the reason that I got into this line of work, though, in addition to like wanting to do something interesting with data and make it more compelling, is because I, I think I suffer from what I call the TMI problem, too much information. I don't remember how to say that in Spanish. Um, but I, I am a bit of a news junkie, and I'm in the news business, and I can't keep up with everything. I want to know what is the most relevant thing that is going on in the world, and at my choice, I would like to be able to dive deeper into it. <laughs> That's a word cloud, I know. I groan when I see them too. And I have, to, I have to apologize to one of my colleagues in particular, Mr. Jake Harris, for using a word cloud. But when I was doing research for this talk, um, I, came up, I found all of these different terms that people in the industry, whether it's a news industry or information architecture, design, um, and whatnot, came, these are all terms that they came up with. And since they were, they were all buzzwords, and some of them are pretty amusing, um, I figured it was appropriate to use a word cloud. Uh, I think my favorite might be infoxication, <laughs> or maybe infobesity. I think that's what happens after big data. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> so with TMI, I'm not talking about uh, releasing less data to the public. I'm not talking about um, that I don't think we should all go home. 
and stop reporting, for sure. Um, I think that we have important jobs to do in making that data make sense. I'm also not talking about redacting. I think there's plenty of that going on in the world. And my apologies to ProPublica for taking some liberties with, with their uh, interactive there. And another thing that I'm definitely not talking about, I think we all have enough of this stuff. Um, so, what am I talking about? I said I was doing research for this talk, and I, I happened to stumble upon uh, a phrase in The Economist that I thought really captured what it is we're, we do, or ideally, what it is we strive for. And I don't normally read off of a slide, but I'm going to try, and hopefully the translation will, will uh, make sense. So the trick is to disclose information in a manner that enhances understanding rather than clouds it. What am I talking about? Oops. So enhancing understanding, right? Not clouding it. Does that make sense to anyone? I hope not. <clears throat> what you were just seeing was what I call the data delusion. Eh, most of it shows up up there, I guess. This is a chart, if the internet works, yeah. So this is a chart that I made um, after the Olympics were over, the Olympics where we were consuming this data feed, and it was just charting the number of messages that we got on the feed every day. And not even just the total number, the number that we actually used. And you can see it peaks at 100,000 messages. And that's just for one day of the competition. And so making sense of that, making sense of, oh, <laughs> it's, it's so much XML that my computer's going to die. Oh, beach ball. Making sense of that is uh, not, is what, I, is what I think this quote is talking about, enhancing understanding not clouding it. Because if we were just to show that XML to our readers or whatever, like this is how it makes me feel just having like had to understand it myself. And certainly we're not gonna put that out there. If any of you have ever seen the show The Prisoner, screenshot from The Prisoner. So, so much data. I was curious and I actually looked up how much data is there going on the internet. And that's how much. I did not know what a exabyte was, so I had to look it up. And um, so this is the amount that flows through as of 2013 every year. An exabyte is, I think, 1,000 terabytes, um, which is 1,000 terabytes, which is 1,000 gigabytes. So it's, it's a lot. So with all of that data you know, streaming through the internet, we want to be beacons, right? We want to um, help people navigate through all of that. Um, signals, right? Signals to noise. So I'm gonna go into some more specific um, examples. Uh, and I've already mentioned the Olympics, so uh, the biggest data set that I ever had to work with and try to make sense of was for the Olympics. And the Summer Games happened last year in London. Um, I was sent uh, with one of my colleagues. As you can see, there were monsters in the Olympic Park. Um, that was actually the mascot for the Olympics. Um, and I didn't realize I'm actually wearing the same outfit, so. Um, <laughs> but so my colleague and I were sent to the Olympics in London, and it was a great experience, but it was also incredibly overwhelming just being there. Um, you already saw what some of the data looked like that we had to work with. That was incredibly overwhelming as well. So at the end though, after we got through all of that data and tried to make sense of it, we ended up with a website that I think we did a pretty okay job on. Um, we were able to, we, I don't know, we had our moments, I think. Uh, some things we did better than others. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple examples of that. But basically, what we, what we were trying to do was present all of these results in a way that gave readers more context, um, better than even the official Olympic website did. So here are some examples of what we did. Here's one where, after I look at it for a little while, it's just, you know, I start to go cross-eyed. 
Um, it's a breakdown of the men's gymnastics, you know, by which event is which, but what do those numbers mean? Um, you could tell like who ranked where, but this is an example like of something that now when the team goes back and looks at it, we're like, hmm, what can we do better next time? And we have, we've already started brainstorming for the next time we have to do something like this. But then there are other examples, um, another table full of numbers. Um, I believe this was the decathlon. Um, as you can see, like even in one event, there's like all of this, all of these pieces of data, and this is only like scratching the surface of what data was actually available to us. Um, I want to show you what the official website looked like, though, for London. So this is. I should probably explain what this event is, um, but this is what the London 2012 website, the official website for the Olympics looks like. And so this is, a, again, another table of results sorted by who won. Um, this event is the modern pentathlon. Um, is anyone actually familiar with this event? No. You are? Yeah? Oh, okay. Um, well, for those of you who haven't heard about it, it's the best event of the Olympics, trust me. Um, it's also probably the weirdest event. Uh, it was created to, uh, it was created in like the late 1800s to test the skills that a soldier would need um, in the late 1800s. So you have to take out your sword or in the Olympics you fence. You fence everyone else who's competing. And whoever like wins the most matches there um, you know, gets the highest score. After that, you have to, going back to the soldier example, uh, once you've done your thing with your sword, you have to swim through a lake or a river or something because, I don't know, because there's a river there. Um, in the Olympics, that means doing a, a, sw a swimming contest, right? I think it's uh, 200 meters. So in the Olympics, they fence and then they run to the pool, they swim in the pool, and then when they get out of the pool, they have to pull on their breeches you know, in their equestrian outfit, and ride the nearest unfamiliar horse. <laughs> and uh, it is actually a rule that has to be unfamiliar. You cannot have met the horse before. Um, and after that, you run and shoot, uh, kind of like James Bond. Uh, and that's the modern pentathlon. However, if you look at this, you would have no idea that even, that it was even made up of, you know, multiple sports, because they don't even show that here. Um, they just show you this result, and it's 5928, whatever that means. So going back to uh, what we did with that data, let me see if that's zoomed in. I think you can see most of it. So we wanted to show people like what all the different pieces were in this event. Um, so the fencing, swimming, equestrian, the rest of it's getting cut off, but you know, it has the running and shooting. And more than that, if I go back real quick, the person who won the gold medal also, also set an, an Olympic record, but there's no indication of that here. So we tried to point that out whenever possible with little icons. So here we have that star OR for uh, Olympic record. And going through the data, we discovered that you can't all, it, it, they don't only tell you when someone breaks a record, they also tell you when they tie it or equal it. So we, tr we ended up using tooltips uh, to show like, oh, this is someone who actually tied versus this is someone who broke it or whatever. And going back to the uh, unfamiliar horse, um, it's, it isn't only that you have to ride an unfamiliar horse, the data that we get actually has these things that I think at best I could describe them as personal ads for horses. I think they're meant to. Um, <clears throat> I think they're meant to give the riders in the event, uh, you know, um, some kind of inkling of what the horse is like that they're going to be riding. Uh, so w we thought that that was just way too funny, and you know, we figured this might be a way to make this table of otherwise kind of dry results and numbers and stuff a, l a little more um, interesting for people to read. So this here. I can read this. Um, 
all of them are like this. So this is saying the horse is a clever jumper. It will look after himself, which I guess is good, um, if allowed, and you know, uh, instructions to the rider. So these were just some of the ways that we tried to spice it up a little bit. Another way that we tried to um, make those tables a little more interesting was trying to uh, make sense of the more complicated rules in some of the competitions. So this is, this is from the pole vault. And in the pole vault, you, I'm sure you guys have all seen the pole vault where they run with the big stick, you know, and they have to go over, uh, and they're scored on like how high they go. Um, what, what I didn't know about pole vault is you don't just get one shot or three shots. You can actually, if you're not, maybe it becomes your turn and you're like, I'm not ready or I'm not feeling it right now, you can pass. Um, if you don't make it, and even in the Olympics, people will miss, uh, you get a miss. Um, if you do clear the, you know, if you do clear it, if you do a successful run, um, you get a score. Um, but you only have to have, I think it's like the best of three. So in addition to having all of these other conditions, you can also say, well, I already had my best three. I'm not going to do any better. I'm going to sit out for the rest of it. So what we did here is we used arrows to show where someone was passing. Um, we used X's to show where they missed. And we showed like, the actual score where they actually got a score. And then we just showed dashes and if, if I was able to scroll over here, um, you'd see like anytime someone starts getting a dash, it's just dashes all the way across because they're done. <clears throat> so um, I think uh, to go back to the too much information thing, I think that it's very, it's wonderful that we, if, if everyone here is employed as a, as a programmer, journalist, data journalist, we all have this great opportunity to produce things and write code and write stories. Um, but I think there's, or, there's a lot of thinking that we should do before we actually write the code and write the stories. We should take a step back. And it's something that I've also been trying to learn to do more and figure out who is my audience? What am I trying to tell them? Why, why would they be interested? Maybe they're not interested. Why do I think that they should be interested and how can I get them interested? It's very important to know what your message is. And finally, writing is good, but editing, that process of curating, beyond copy editing, right, or proofreading, editing, curating is the most important. Of course, there, you can't curate or edit without the content in the first place, but I can't emphasize enough to myself in my work and to all of you just how important that process is. So thank you, or gracias. And hack the planet. <laughs>